Hi, this is Tamsin Granger. This is Dan Abuhoff. With Tamsin and Dan Read the Paper. It is Sunday, August 5th, right. 2018. Right. Uh, we're back on the beam. <laughs> right? The beam. Yes. We're we not are. on vacation. No. We're not relaxed. We're hard at work. Yes. 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 And we have a lot to talk about. But uh, especially, you have a lot of ranting to do about sports, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. I do. Although I should say before I get carried away, uh, happy birthday to my brother Bob. It's August 7th. It's coming up just when we release the cast. So, Oh, you know, my sister had a milestone. Really? Yes. She recently celebrated her 55th. 55.5 years. Do people celebrate things like that? Well, if it's 55.5, I guess. Happy 55.5, okay. Sarah. All right. Well, my brother's not 55, but we're not going to get into that. But in any event... Uh, ah, those were the days. <laughs> the days. Well, should I start ranting, or are you ready for that? I'm ready for the rant. All right. Well, here's the Lay rant. it on me, baby. All right. So here we are in the throes of uh, the baseball season. It's August. Things are tightening up. Pennant races are heating up. As anyone who follows sports even a little bit knows, the Yankees are playing the Red Sox. I'm not a Yankees fan, but I can't help but notice that this is the critical series all baseball fans, and frankly all sports fans, are focused on, and it's somewhat New York-centric as well as Boston-centric. So one turns to the sports section this Sunday to see the Times' insight into this highly contested series. And the it, New York Times. The New York Times. The New York Times. The oddly and inappropriately titled Looking New York Times. Looking for an article about the New York Yankees. Or, or, or any sports, really. But instead, the headline and the full page is about, that's right, taxidermy. Taxidermy. The Times' lead sports section article is about taxidermy. And it's not just the lead. It's the whole first page of uh, Sports Sunday. Above and below the, the fold. And, and, and that's not it. And plus, it's two or three pages inside. And more to the point, there's so much about that and a couple of other what I'll call marginally sports article. There is nothing on the Yankees and Red Sox. Not a, not a secondary article, not a lesser article, not a, uh, not a, a small time article. Zippo. Didn't make the sports cut for the Times because there's a lot of taxidermy going on. <laughs> so uh, we step into the breach just to bring you uh, up to speed on what's going on in sports. But at least they're being consistent. The sports uh, editors at the New York Times still not interested in sports. Not interested in sports. No. If they find some people interested in sports, maybe we'll have some sports articles later in the season or in some other year. But in any event, uh, so what's happening in sports? Uh, well, of course, I already mentioned the Yankees are playing the Red Sox. The Mets uh, made big headlines this year by losing a baseball game 25-4. to 4. It wouldn't be that notable, but it's baseball. If you lost a football game, something like 25-4, to 4, 24 to 7, no big deal. 25-4 is, uh, is a lot, is a load. It's a lot. It's an impossible amount to lose a baseball game by. It really sounds like a middle school girl's uh, softball game. Against uh, very uneven... Uh, it will be tough. Uh, maybe, uh, I don't know. I don't know enough about middle school, middle school girls to say. But it it doesn't. It certainly wasn't competitive. It was 16 nothing uh, in the fourth inning, at which point I texted Sadie, and I had forgotten to text Sadie to remind me that she was at the game. It was in Washington. They were playing the National In League. full Mets regalia. Talking about getting abuse at a baseball game. <laughs> Sadie's sitting there in a Mets jersey as her team falls behind 19 to nothing. Uh, they rallied, but then fell behind again, uh, 25 to 4, in part because they had a position player, Jose Reyes, pitch the last uh, inning, and he gave up uh, six runs, I believe. He was hit pretty hard. And what's interesting about that is that you wouldn't expect a position player to succeed in that situation, just saving the bullpen. But after the game, Mickey Calloway was uh, was interviewed. And the first thing he talked about is how hard Jose Reyes was hit. As if <laughs> as if when we put our shortstop out there to pitch, we expect a, a little bit better performance than right, that. Right, right. He, and his observation, and he was serious, uh, oddly. I, w I wonder how Reyes felt about that comment. He, he said he didn't feel no. good, but he finished the inning, which is something. And his observation was that... Uh, People don't hit batting practice that hard. So I, he really rubbed it in on Reyes. Reyes, to his defense, uh, became the uh, only major leaguer to give up two home runs in a game as a pitcher, and the next night hit two, two home runs by himself. So he got well, that some, is something. some measure of revenge. But if I was Reyes, I'd never step up again. 
Uh, I don't know. To Reyes, do that kind of thing. Reyes uh, at this point in career, he's looking for experiences more All than right. anything else. So, All right. Anyway, so we'll have a little more sports later on, but I'll give you a little taste of what the Times is a little falling behind on. Okay, that's all you got? Oh, it's up to me up to, to uh, um, introduce the uh, idea of the fading into history of the hobbyist reenactor. Mm-hmm. And uh, that is, uh, there's an article, there was an article in the New York Times this week about how there are fewer and fewer Civil War re- reenactors oh. around. Mm. That uh, 20 years ago, uh, a reenactment would uh, of uh, something like the Gettysburg uh, battle would attract thirty to fifty thousand wow. reenactors. Just twenty years ago. Uh, right. Yeah, nineteen ninety eight, and um, this past one, which was the hundred and fifty fifth anniversary, it just attracted six thousand. Yeah. Okay, which still seems like a lot to me. Thousands of, of to people. me, it seems about six thousand um, more than I expected. But expect. the yes. the hobby is dwindling, mm. uh, and uh, you know, I mean, it's all very. Awkward. Uh, they do make a point. The reenactors make a point. It's about the camaraderie. It's about the history, uh, etc. And uh, they don't spend much time worrying about the politics of it. Um, so, you know, I mean, that could be uh, controversial, don't you think? Um, but, uh, you know, even at the uh, Gettysburg uh, reenactment, it was quite a festivity. They have four days of yeah. mock skirmishes. Yeah. And uh, on Saturday night, there's a big ball uh, in the style of uh, the 1860s. And uh, they even have things like uh, an Abe Lincoln impersonator around oh. that you can take pictures with. Oh. <laughs> Etc. Yeah. Um, so, but uh, so I don't know if this is something to worry about or not. That uh, these uh, things are dwindling. You might be interested in where it all started, yeah. and uh, it starts with reenactments of things like the Revolutionary War battles. Naturally, and um, that uh, the um, that were done for celebrations and fun. With fireworks, etc., uh, even uh, before the Civil War, right. and in fact, some people they were very popular in the North. Okay, the Yankees had what they called sham battles a lot, apparently, yeah. right. and people loved them. And it was something they did on Fourth uh, of July around Christmas time to put people. Oh. In a festive mood, well, the Revolutionary War is a little less controversial. Well, then you know. As uh, we're about to, as, as um, the U.S. is about to venture into civil war, um, in the Confederacy, they're actually saying, you know, those Yankees have it up on us because yeah. they they've been practicing, you know, with these sham battles. You know, right. our guys are not ready, and they do try to uh, mobilize uh, some sham events of their own, but uh, they really don't have the I guess, financial wherewithal Uh to do as much. But they felt it was actually productive to get uh, young men used to the confusion um, and uh, the intensity of battle. Okay, so it was good for practice. But here's another side of sham battles, um, reenactments, and that is uh, they start out with, you know, there are spectators, and uh, but you might be surprised to know there were spectators even for real battles. Really? The Battle of uh, Bull Run yeah. had like 500 spectators. Congressmen, um, senators, random people. Uh, there were, you know, uh, ladies with food trucks there, you know, just as you'd have the spectators at the reenactment today. Wow. So, uh, you know, just a couple of... Uh, interesting notes about that well what i always think of you know is, is it, whenever i see these reenactments i'm always saying my god it's hot outside and those guys are wearing those uniforms so it's, to me it's a global it's exactly what i've always thought you yeah. see the guys in the wool and some of them are um very you know traditional right. they only want to eat hard tack and bad hard tack right. and uh they're um their motto is something like uh, we um 
we try to be as authentic as we can without getting dysentery. Yeah, that's a fine line. Uh, so, speaking of uh, avoiding dysentery... Who wouldn't want to take that up as no. a hobby? <laughs> That's a motto that's catchy, you know, it's beyond that. So a controversy that's written up in the paper and I think has gotten a little play is the notion that in San Francisco they're passing an ordinance uh, pursuant to which these uh, high-tech firms, which offer as a perk uh, in-house cafeterias and uh, food benefits and things like that, would no longer be able to have cafeterias and the point being that the workers would be forced to leave the building at lunchtime and uh, and would patronize the local options for lunch, the local restaurants. Uh, putting aside uh, the fact that a lot of people don't spend a lot of time at lunch anymore, which apparently San Francisco is not on to, um, <laughs> this is uh, – and, and, and it's a dangerous neighborhood, the one that they're focused on. It's filled with drug dealers and the like. So a lot of reasons not to go out for lunch. But putting all that aside – uh, this is really nuts. It's it really is really nuts. I mean, last week we had WeWork yeah. telling people they can't eat meat, right? right? But now, now, now we have uh, right. the city of San Francisco telling people where they well, can well, eat there's, lunch. There's, apparently, there's, you know, first it's it's the large organizations, then it's the government. There's no shortage of people willing to tell other people what to do. I think that's that's, that's been clear for some time. Meanwhile, this is sad because San Francisco is a mess. Yeah. Is a mess. Right. The, there's re- recently a lot of talk about uh, certain conventions don't want to go there anymore because it's just too dirty. Yeah. Um, well, etc. It, uh, it, it's a mixed thing, but the, the thing is, a, you know, you think of San Francisco as just a, a great blossoming center of the Silicon universe, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, so they but should but, be doing things a lot better. It's, it's so they? people, I don't want people to think we're giving this short shrift because they're going to say, "Well, isn't there something to it? It's going to help the businesses." Let me just, in one sense, explain how dumb this is. This is like passing law which says that you at home cannot make your own dinner. You have to go out. That's all this is. It's like, it's the exact same thing. You know what helped our business? If nobody made their dinner, they had to go out. So the government's now going to tell you you can't make your own dinner. I mean, it's, let's stop there. It's nuts. Right. Nuts. So there you go. Nuts. San Francisco. Uh uh, but you had something that's even more weird to me, which is a... Uh, uh, well, truth is always stranger than fiction, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And uh, so I was thumbing through the paper the other day and came across a story about people that lived on an island in Indonesia. Okay. Mm-hmm. In 2003, researchers digging in a mountain cave in the Indonesian island of Flores discovered astonishing fossils of tiny human-like individual with a small chimp-sized brain they called the species homo florinensis um and uh, this was there seemed to be people living on this island very small a yeah. size of about three feet right there are people living there today yeah. whose average height is about four foot nine hmm Okay, and uh, one thing leads to another, and the question is, okay, um, are these smaller humans in any way related to those early, you know, uh, flores? Right, early genus of humans who were small. Right. Yeah. And was there some kind of interbreeding, et cetera? And here's the scary answer. And the thing is, no. That's they've, the scary part. They've been doing, they've <laughs> been able to do DNA analysis. Right. Okay. And there isn't a link. Right. Between those humans and the early small humans. Right. And yet people here are smaller. Because, so what, okay? what that says? Not just humans. Okay. Yeah. Um, elephants are smaller. Who have arrived on the island right. twice. Okay. Have ended up becoming well, smaller, the developing, so, evolved into dwarf right. elephants. Right, exactly evolved. In other words, future generations became smaller. smaller. Yes, yeah. yes. It's not. It's not that they shrank. It's yeah. not they arrived and then they got smaller. But, but they is, evolved. You're but right. the reason I say it's alarming and crazy is that uh, the island makes you small. I mean, that, the island makes you small. <laughs> the island makes you small. Whether you're a human. Or an animal, the island makes you small. So they're trying to figure that out. It's, yes, I hope they do. <laughs> okay. I would get on it and, immediately. Uh, they say, you know, I mean, it's, it's it's some kind of evolutionary process, okay? Um, one leading hypothesis for the evolution of the pygmy body type is shortage of 
food. A smaller body demands fewer calories and may offer a survival advantage. Okay. Yeah. Um, whatever the ecological factors are for island dwarfism, they are present in spades on this island. Uh, says the researcher, Dr. Green uh, of Flores. That's what makes this so fascinating. Yeah, alarming. I'll go with alarming. Okay. And <laughs> interestingly crazy. enough, some of this work is being done by uh, Dr. Uh, Serena Tucci, who is now at Princeton. Oh, really? Yay, Princeton. Okay. Uh, I thought you were going to say she's related to Stanley Tucci, and we have something. Not a very tall man, by the way. Uh, but speaking of... All right, don't get any rumors started. Okay, speak, well, speaking of short figures, the next article is about ventriloquism. That's right, dummies who tend not to be particularly large. Now, ventriloquism... Wait, wait, wait tell me about dummies. Do you get that at all? Well, I mean, I used to watch uh, the Ed Sullivan show. Okay. And uh, who's, uh, who's Candace Bergen's... Right, okay. So let, right. let's start with that. Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy yeah. are the classic ventriloquist act. Now, let, let's just, let me just... I never got it. Can I pause for a second? It was second? never funny. There's a reason why you didn't why? get it. I'm going to explain it, okay? Number one, we have to establish there were... Edgar Bergen was, was the ventriloquist, the, the dummy Charlie McCarthy, enormously popular. So popular in the 30s and 40s, he got an honorary Academy Award. He did, did, did some films, but not much. But he was just a, a cultural icon. And you're saying to yourself, I watched on television, I didn't like it. And let me explain why. Edgar Bergen was a radio ventriloquist. In other words, he couldn't throw his voice. He couldn't speak with his mouth closed. He was great on the radio. But when you put him on the radio, he's just acting two different parts. That's all. That's all he did. But when you, then you put him on television, people are going, I don't understand. He's the guy just talking twice. It, it, it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't make any sense. So but, the guy on the show with right. the little puppet sitting right. on his lap no and the mouth is moving. No one could see it. So this, so this is an American. But, but, but was this like a normal but, vaudeville but, act or yes. was this a radio but let me, act? Let me just pull it. This is a simpler America. In which people are sitting there listening to the radio show. It's amazing. It's, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. How does he do it? And it's the radio. Okay. So how is that? So at any rate, so that's the past. So the present is there's a new generation of ventriloquists. And interesting, what's spearheading the new interest in this is that uh, most recently in 2017, the winner of the competition television show America's Got Talent was a 13-year-old ventriloquist by the name of Dorsey Lynn former and this is the articles about a ventriloquist convention and a lot of people who are young people who are saying they're inspired and their interest was enhanced by watching this woman Darcy Lynn former well as a matter of fact two other ventriloquists have won America's Got Talent it is a show that has been pushing ventriloquists or, or let me put it another way America's Got Talented Ventriloquists that's what we've got and uh, a lot so, of people are getting into it. So there's a revival in ventriloquism. Uh, or let me put it We're way. running out of reenactors, <laughs> but we have more. I, I don't get it well, at all. Yeah, well, here's what. Maybe you know, I have to watch let me, this. Let me make this connection. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know if there's a revival such that you're going to see ventriloquists wherever you go. But, but these shows like America's Got Talent are like vaudeville reinstituted. It's like television vaudeville. It's like, can we get acts? They're dying for acts. And guess what gets a chance? A lot of the acts are really queer, quirky. 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 Yeah. yeah. And that's, and this works for ventriloquism. In other words, you can't, you can't work ventriloquists too often into standard variety shows and big time acts. They're not going to open for Beyonce. But America's got talent. They're right there. I don't know. Beyonce is pretty creative. Well, we'll see. Give her a chance. Maybe she'll read this article. Well, there's not a lot to say about this, except that there's, there's renewed interest in it. A lot of people are very dedicated to it. There's a lot of artistry in making the puppets themselves. You can buy a puppet if you want to get into it. It can cost you close to $1,000. Do I smell retirement <laughs> idea? Let me tell you something. <laughs> if, you could, if, if we can get into ventriloquism on the radio, I'm in. I, I'm your guy. All right. We're doing something like that now. <laughs> uh, is that what it is? <laughs> we'll decide. We both decide today who the dummy is. Okay, some, the Almond Milk Wars. Yes, the Almond Milk Wars. You've been, you've been stewing about this for quite some time. Well, this is just funny because the dairy industry, well, the dairy industry is going through, you know, uh, terrible throes. And we've talked about all the kind of solutions they're trying to come up with, uh, reusing and recycling dairy farms, right. um, trying to uh, sell uh, organic, develop organic products as opposed to regular and get a higher price. Um, but one of the things they're fighting against um, is the idea of calling almond 
milk, milk. Right. Okay, because it's not milk. Milk comes from cows. Right. And you have soy milk. You have cashew milk. Uh, you have, uh, you know, should these products get the name milk? Right. Okay, so funny note here. We recently met an almond farmer. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, it turns out there are virtually no almonds in almond milk. Right. Well, I I should, I'm exaggerating. I'm exaggerating. There are not too many. Right. And so I did look at the label. Uh, because we do buy almond milk. We swear right. by almond milk. Almonds are so good for you. Right. And you figure like, oh, I'll put almonds in my, you know, almond milk in uh, my smoothies and this, that, and the right. other thing. And it will improve my skin so and a million other things. how many almonds are almond? Well, it doesn't say how many, but here's it. The primary ingredient, it does say the number one ingredient, almond milk. But it's all one word, almond milk. And then in parentheses, okay, it breaks it down. Between number one, filtered water, yeah. comma almonds. Yeah. Okay. So you know what that means. Right. That water. means that uh, there water. could be two almonds yeah. in there. Right. It's just the water has been exposed to. Well, it breaks down some almonds. I, I, you know, I was imagining they're taking zillions of almonds, yeah, grinding almonds them up, exactly. and somehow the they magically become a milk product. Yeah. Okay, so there is that. So just we should acknowledge that there's not all that much. Almond and almond milk, but um, actually the article that you uh, pulled out for me does um, point out that there are other compound words used for products that uh, don't really reflect what the product is either, like peanut butter, Mm -hmm. okay? Peanut butter, it's it's a paste of ground peanuts. It slightly resembles butter, but it's not butter, okay? So now are you going to rename peanut butter, uh, you know, et cetera, and so forth. Um, uh, jellyfish, you know, jellyfish doesn't really look like a fish, not really a fish per se. Uh, so we're going to have to, you know, it seems, you know, dictionary wise that, uh, there's nothing wrong with the almond milk word. Yeah, yeah but it, uh, yes, but look, two issues. Number one, almonds don't lactate. I guess I can get over that. But number two, is you did have, do have the image that uh, almond milk is stuffed with almonds, and if it's not, it's kind of disappointing, right? Yes, very disappointing. Uh, well, yeah. I think we should just I'm eat disappointed. almonds. Yeah, I think that's the answer. Uh, all right, so here's a, a, a cautionary tale. So I, I saw the obituaries on Wednesday, and my my uh, eye is first drawn to the article that says Mary Jane McCaffrey Monroe, 106 proctologist dies, and I say to myself, well. 106 years old, a woman, she was a proctologist, that's unusual. Even more unusual that uh, the New York Times is writing about a person who's a proctologist. And it turns out, when you can closer inspection, she's not a proctologist, she's a protocolist. <laughs> <laughs> Let me spell that. P-R-O-T-O-C-O-L-I-S-T. That meant that she kept the appointment book for Mamie Eisenhower. She was an expert on etiquette. On protocol. Not a proctologist. Very disappointing, right? Yeah. So then I skipped to the next article. And I had the same problem. It says... You know, if you had given me a little time, there, <laughs> I think we could go a lot of places. Oh, well, you could consider it while I go to the next yeah. one. So the next one, I say, Tony Canigliaro, 77, uh, baseball player. And I'm saying to myself, Tony Canigliaro, I thought he was dead already, whatever. Tony Canigliaro was a great slugger for the Red Sox. His, his career was cut short because he was being... And he had an injury that's affected his hitting going forward. And then I read more closely, and it wasn't Tony Canigliaro. It was Tony Cloninger. And this is a mistake often made over the years. The name sounds familiar. But Tony Cloninger, uh, I did remember, and the obituary talks about this. He was a, you know, good but not great pitcher. But here's what distinguished Tony Cloninger. Tony Cloninger hit two grand slam home runs in the same game. A pitcher. He was the first player to do this. It's stunning that a pitcher could hit two Grand Slam home runs in the same game. But here's something that's more stunning. Uh, Years later, several other people came to hit two Grand Slams in the same game. By now, it's maybe 10 people have done it. But here's the most amazing one. Fernando Tatis, who later played for the Mets and his son is now in the minor leagues. He did this in 1999. When he played for the St. Louis Cardinals, hit two Grand Slams in the same game. Inning, in the same inning, two grand slams. Two times you got up with the base load in the same inning and hit a home run. But that's not even the most amazing part. I want you to brace yourself. 
I'm bracing myself. The most amazing part is he hit those two grand slams in the same inning off the same pitcher. Really? They kept the pitcher <laughs> they in? They kept the pitcher <laughs> in. They kept the pitcher in. The pitcher is, was, is Chan Ho Park, who became a very successful pitcher, Korean, one of the few great Korean pitchers. It was early in his career, and he gave a grand slam home run. They kept him in. He kept giving up runs, and they let him load the bases again, and Tatis got up again, and he hit another grand slam home run off Chan Ho Park. The same pitcher gave up two Grand Slam home runs in the same inning to the same player. Was that another like twenty six to four game? Uh, no, it was it? But it was a lopsided game. And and the manager who kept him in, by the way, was Davey Johnson. Really? Who was previously the manager of the Mets? And he was kind yeah. of an oddball guy. So in any event, I thought you'd be interested in that fact. But you got to read those obituaries carefully. <laughs> <laughs> So go ahead. Or you could end up in the wrong end of things. Oh, she does it. I knew she'd come up with something. Nice job. Anyway, um, so uh, museum update. Yeah. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. Um, if you're in New York, uh, from now through January 6th at the Museum of the City of New York, which is a fun museum. Uh, it is kind of at the top of museum. Well, is it the top of museum mile? I guess it's on Fifth Avenue, way up. Yeah. North. Okay. Right. Um, and uh, it has some interesting uh, um, exhibitions in general uh, in it about yeah. New York life. Anyway, it has an exhibition called Rebel Women Defying Victorianism. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, what makes it fun is just it's full of all kinds of characters uh, that are just interesting to know about, including one Victoria Woodhall who um, announced in, on April 2nd, 1870, she, when she was 31, a stockbroker and newspaper publisher uh, announced she would be the first woman ever to run for president. Hmm. Uh, she says, I am quite aware... I am quite well aware that in assuming this position, I shall evoke more ridicule than enthusiasm at the outset, but this is an epoch of sudden changes and startling surprises. What may appear absurd today will assume a serious aspect tomorrow. Uh, she actually is in jail by the time uh, that uh, rolls around, yeah. uh, the election rolls around, so she does not get to run for president. But that's an interesting story, too. Yeah. Some of the other women included a Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart, who became the first licensed black female physician in the state and the on only the third black woman nationwide to receive a medical degree after she graduated valedictorian of her class at New York Medical College in 1870. Wow. Um, she was also a, a leading political pioneer and her sister was the first black female principal in a city public school in 1863. Okay, so that, they're kind of interesting. Then at the opposite end of the spectrum, there's Helen Jewett, uh, who uh, was also known as Ellen Jewett, who was one of the most popular prostitutes, the city's leading prostitute in the 1830s. <laughs> really? Okay, nice, nice work, she, <laughs> she was known to stroll down the street unaccompanied yeah. and in a green <clears throat> dress, her signature green dress. Yes, yes. Unfortunately, uh, in 1836, at the age of 23, she is found um, axed to death oh, God. Uh, in her brothel bed. Um, Thank you for with, that. Well, and and just a couple more yeah. who are fun to read about. Um, there's a woman, Anne Lohman, also known as Madame Restel, who amasses a tremendous fortune selling birth control products and uh, ab abortion services. Oh, wow. She really amasses an amazing fortune. There's another woman, Hetty Green, called the Witch of Wall Street, okay, um, who was supposed to be the most miserly woman ever. She said, like in the Guinness Book of Ro uh, World Records, uh, she was a very shrewd investor. She actually invested, um, first of all, when she gets married, mm -hmm. she actually uh, puts together a prenup. 
okay, mm-hmm. to keep her husband's money separate from hers. And she invests her money on her own, um, in part on greenbacks, um, uh, that were being issued uh, after the Civil War, etc. Also, she uh, ends up uh, loaning the city, as in New York City, more than a million dollars in the Panic of 1907, Okay, oh. when other people wouldn't, and she makes a tr- fortune off of that as well. So, I mean, it, it's just, it's fun. You, um, you always hear people saying, oh, women never did this women haven't done this before um it's it's fun to uh, see some yeah. uh, publicity for these different pioneers yeah i mean uh, that is interesting uh so just quickly this is just odd there's a cartoon series called the finnish nightmares which is just this sort of a stick figure kind of cute drawing thing that uh, some finnish cartoonist puts together which uh, sort of uh, depicts, you know, situations of social awkwardness, as they put it. But they're just little funny things about somebody wants to get the free sample, but they don't want to talk with the salesperson and, you know, that, that, that kind of stuff. There's not a lot there. Um, but what's interesting about it is uh, it's become a huge hit in China. In China. Apparently people are getting this through social media. And... Uh, you know, there are little episodes like, uh, you know, the character flags down a bus by accident, feels compelled. Now they have to take the bus. They have to take it for a few stops, even though it's going. So it's like Seinfeld kind it's, of. It's like Seinfeld vignettes. stuff in cartoons. And and people are eating it up for the Chinese. And, and so they're analyzing how is this happening? Why is this happening? And, uh, you know, it, first of all, it apparently it's become such a big deal that it's been trending on social media. And it, it spawned a new word for social awkwardness in Mandarin. Which is Jingfen or spiritually Finnish. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, and the reason is the you know what the scholars have come up with. Uh, they're in Finland as much as anything. They're saying that even though the Chinese are depicted as being hard driving, uh, especially in the face of some uh, you know free enterprise opportunities which didn't previously exist, essentially Chinese people have a shy, introverted, and bashful side, just like the Finnish. And this helps them to. Uh, Explore. I mean, uh, look, I mean, the Chinese have always uh, vacationed in an inordinate degree in Finland, including because of the, the place that we discovered earlier, which is the real where Santa Claus lives. Right. They go right. there more than anybody. Right. They have a fascination with Finland. And now they're interested in this because these characters have a certain vulnerability they identify with. That is so funny. The world is getting smaller and smaller. Yeah. And that's an odd connection I would have never made. So finally, the last article that caught my eye. And I would never have thought I was interested in this. Never. Uh, but I am. And it has to do with uh, Mission Impossible, the new movie with Tom Cruise. I'm not a huge Tom Cruise fan. Uh, Mission Impossible to me is was a TV series, not so much a movie series. But I know that there are movies. And there is an article here about the stunts in Mission Impossible. Number one, they... The stunts. The stunts. Another yeah. thing I'm totally not interested in. But, but... They say, number one, Tom Cruise does his own stunts. Do you say, well, maybe. Yeah, we know he does his own stunts because he broke his foot or something. Oh, well, there's a big to-do about it because, uh, right. you know, I, right. he had an injury. Fine. So maybe he does his own stunts. Maybe I believe that. But what's the big deal? Here's the big deal. They describe five stunts in this movie, which we haven't seen yet. Maybe we will because of this. Here's the first one. Here's one that requires him to hold his breath underwater well, you know, they do some uh, some procedure or something like that. Well, it turns out he had to learn how to hold his breath. He only was able, he was able to hold his breath like most people, a minute and a half. He learned to hold his breath for six minutes. I don't even believe that. I, I'm, how it, is that even possible? This is in the New York Times. He's holding his breath for six minutes. All right, but let's not pause at anyone because I have trouble believing it too. Here's a second one. Paris Motorcycle Chase. They have him doing the mo- on the motorcycle by himself. He's on. He's going a hundred miles an hour. He's uh, you know dealing with these other cars. He's on cobblestones, which you know from bicycles is tough to deal with. Yes, and it's raining. And it's raining. <laughs> have, and he did this. And they have a camera near his face so they can watch him act at the same time. So if it goes wrong, his face is going into the camera. They must have some life insurance. <laughs> <I> mean, <right? laughs> this is great. The third, the only five are going to go real fast. Skydiving, 
Once, once the skydiving is crazy enough, but the skydiving is before the parachute goes out, he has to get next to another guy. He has to, un, the stunt double for Henry Cappell, who doesn't do this, he has to unpack something in his backpack. And before it's time that, he, you know, he's done with this, then he can release his parachute. The fourth one was hanging off a plane. Always a crowd pleaser. And they say, what could go wrong hanging off a plane? They said, well, when we first prepared it, propose it to Airbus that people make the plane, they say, no, you can't do that. And they said to Airbus, okay, well, let's assume we were going to do it just for the giggles of it. How would you go about it? And they explained, and they said, even though, and they ended up doing it. So he's hanging in a plane. They said, so he's in a harness, but that's not going to help him because he's the kind of things that can happen. Number one, uh, a pebble could, you know, spit out of something and hit him, and it would be like a shotgun. Uh, a bird could uh, come by and strike him. It would be like a cannonball, right? And uh, or the uh, other pilot could accelerate a little bit too much uh, off schedule, and which he just go flying. Okay. And the final one, the fifth one, which is crazier than all the others, is the helicopter chase. And the funny thing is, or the odd thing is, Tom Cruise doesn't know how to uh, pilot a helicopter. Right. So, so they say that's no problem. We'll train him. So he goes to the normal to helicopter school, and yeah. to save time, he does it 16 hours a day of training, cuts the normal training time in half, but he's still a newbie helicopter pilot. Doesn't bother them. He's doing a scene with another helicopter in which he's close enough to the other helicopter that he is a rotor width away of the other helicopter, and they are in close proximity the entire scene. It was, quote, like flying through a broom closet. All right? This is craziness. But here's my question. Yes, go ahead. I mean, obviously, uh, we have the facility yeah. to um, fabricate yeah. these scenes yes. without putting anybody at risk. Right. Is it that much more exciting? Is that, I mean, he may have his own reasons for wanting to uh, be able to do these things. Does it mean anything to the viewer at all? Well, uh, let me take one at a time. Number one, according to the article, again, we take those grain of salt, that they're watching him in this terrifying helicopter scene, and they're saying, we're all nervous except Tom, who's having the time of his life. Take it for what it's worth. That's what they say. So they say he thrives on this kind of adventure we're thing. All, we're all nervous if it's fake. Uh, yeah. Right? That's point one. Point so two. So I'm glad he's having a good time. Look, it, it, does it enhance interest in the movie? I think it enhances my interest in the movie. Because it's just craziness. It's just you can't believe people do this kind of thing. So I listen, would look listen, at it buddy, differently. Don't get any ideas, okay? <laughs> got, All right. You're... This sounds like this just smells totally like a midlife crisis, okay. aging uh, matinee idol. You know, are we talking has about? To, uh, are we talking about create new? If you or Tom Cruise? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Well, you know, the matinee idol, I can go with the aging part. I'm not so sure, but yeah. Uh, uh, all right. Well, look, it just, it was eye opening to me. It got me reading about it. There's nothing else I could imagine myself reading about in respect to a Mission Impossible movie, but now I'm intrigued. Okay. We'll, ha we'll have to fly it's, somewhere so you can watch it, it for free on it, the airplane. It's tapping into some part of my, uh, my mental, male mental makeup that I didn't know previously existed. Let's, uh, you know, what can I say? Live and learn. Live and learn. Okay. So, uh, that wraps it up. Uh, another fascinating week with, uh, Tamsin Dan read the paper. And we'll uh, see you next time. We will indeed. Thanks a lot.